Thank you, and good, uh, good morning or good afternoon, I guess, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak to everyone and share some of my experience and knowledge with uh, fish-friendly turbines. So I, I guess I'm, I'm here to tell you that you don't need downstream fish passage facilities. You just need a fish-friendly turbine. <laughs> the fish will be happy, the project owners will be happy, and we all won't have any jobs. <laughs> Um, but unfortunately, that's not the case. It's not quite that simple, um, but there are some pretty good advancements that have been occurring with fish-friendly turbines, and so I'm going to share some of that information today. You already have seen a little bit about some of the technologies that have been employed over here, the, the low-head devices, um, but there are a couple other things I'm going to talk about uh, leading up to the turbines. Uh, Armin Peter asked me when I was putting my talk together if I could also discuss a little bit about the injury mechanisms, you know, the, the types of things that injure fish when they go through turbines. How do we estimate turbine survival? And there are basically two approaches. One is theoretical models, particularly to estimate blade strike. And uh, there are also several field methods that have been employed, different tagging technologies. Um, and then finally, I'll go into the fish-friendly turbine designs, ones that we've had experience with in the U.S. And then some of the other, I'll, I'll sort of cover again some of the information on the low head turbines uh, and then just to summarize everything quickly at the end. Okay, thanks. <laughs> All right, so to start, there, there are three things or three mortality types that we need to be aware of. Um, and the first is direct mortality. So that is if, when a fish goes through the turbine, it suffers a lethal injury and, and pretty much immediate mortality. Uh, there's indirect mortality, which is due to sublethal injuries or possibly disorientation. So the fish makes it through, comes out alive, but it may be injured. It may have a lot of scale loss. It's, it consequently, consequently, it may be more susceptible to predation, disease, stress, it's not as fit, it may not be able to complete its migration. The third one here is delayed mortality, and this is sort of uh, something that's been talked about more recently, particularly in the Columbia River, and with salmon smolts, and that is that when the fish gets to the, the end of the river and into the estuary in the ocean, there is evidence that there's mortality that occurs in the marine environment that is related to the hydropower experience and passing through several turbines. Um, for my talk, I'm going to just focus on direct mortality. Um, and it's not that the other two aren't that important, but when it comes to fish-friendly turbines, we're most interested in how the fish does when it passes through and, and how it looks on the other end. Um, but the other two are obviously big issues that need to be investigated when you're looking at the whole project survival. So to start with the injury mechanisms, this is your typical uh, Kaplan or propeller turbine, and it just highlights the different uh, uh, mechanisms that can injure fish. Shear is just changes in velocity of water, either uh, two velocities crossing paths or water moving along a solid surface. If it's high enough, it, it can cause distortion in the fish and injury. Um, you can have rapidly increasing pressure that could impact fish, particularly those that are acclimated near the surface. You have grinding, fish getting between stationary and moving parts or two moving parts. Uh, rapid decrease in pressure. So on the downstream side of the blades, the fish go through increasing pressure and then rapidly can experience subatmospheric pressures. Cavitation um, is also an issue. Um, and then turbulence on the downstream side where we get a very turbulent flow that can toss fish around. And uh, of course, blade strike. And when you put all these together, uh, for most turbines, and depending on fish size and the design and operation of the turbine, about 5 to 30 percent of fish passing through turbines are killed. Um, there are some turbines out there where, where the mortality is less. It might be on the order of 2 or 3 percent. And there are some where it's more in the case of eels moving through some, uh, uh, you know, both Kaplan and Francis units. Um, but generally, it's about 5 to 30 percent. So there are two injury mechanisms I'm going to focus on, uh, and they include pressure 
and that is the, the rapidly decreasing pressures. And then I'll talk more about blade strike. And it's not that the other ones aren't important, but these two have particularly been identified, at least in the U.S., as likely causing the most damage to fish when they go through turbines. And they also can be addressed somewhat in the design of turbines to make them fish friendlier. So for pressure, um, the most important thing is that minimum absolute pressure that the fish may experience when it goes through the turbine blades. Uh, how rapidly that pressure changes occur is also a factor, and then how quickly fish can adjust to that change. And this is often dependent on whether it's a Physostomus species or a Physoclistus species. So Physostomus having that connection between the esophagus and the air bladder so it can release air quickly. Um, and the phys physiclistus where they don't have that connection and it takes much more effort to when, that, when their swim bladders um, inflate to get rid of that excess air. So physiclistus species can experience much more pressure damage uh, than physostoma species. And then the, based on the information and the testing that's been done, there has been a lot of work out of the Northwest and in, in, in uh, the U.S at the Pacific National Northwest Laboratory. And they have put, using an experimental chamber, have put fish through uh, testing with, with sort of the regime, pressure regime, that they experience go through in the turbines. And you can see that here on this slide. Um, on the top slide, this is the pressure regime of a fish going through the turbine, one that is acclimated at the surface in the blue line, a fish acclimated to a deeper uh, depth, and so as they move through the turbine, you can see how the pressure increases. When they pass through the blades, you can get into subatmospheric pressures and then back into the tail race where the, the pressures are closer to atmospheric. And so it, they basically identified that if you keep the pressure, the minimum pressure, down to 7.5 to 15 psi or 50 to 100 kilopascals, um, you likely minimize any kind of pressure damage uh, to the fish. And this just gives an example of, of uh, one of the big issues is that acclimation pressure or where the fish are acclimated versus the minimum pressure they go through. So this is the ratio of the pressure change. So if a fish was acclimated at 100 kilopascals and it went through 33 uh, kilopascals, it would be a ratio of three. And you can see here, this shows mortality, the probability of mortality versus the ratio. And so likely if a fish went through that, um, it had that ratio of pressure change, it might experience about 20% mortality. But the important thing is to remember that pressure, the minimum pressures uh, that occur in a turbine do not occur over the entire cross section of the turbine. So the probability that a fish will experience a minimum pressure isn't 100%, and it can be much lower than that. So moving on to mechanical damage, this covers collisions between fish and moving turbine blades, fixed structures, so that's stay veins, wicket gates, and then obviously uh, blades and, and um, other flow straighteners. There's grinding and pinching that can occur between different components of the unit, and then there's abrasion from contact uh, with stationary or, or moving surfaces. But when it comes to mechanical damage, uh, definitely blade strike is the primary injury mechanism that everybody's focused on that we typically see that fish experience. Um, and for many hydro projects, particularly low head projects where pressure really is not a big issue, this will be the primary source of injury and mortality. Strike probability depends on blade spacing, rotational speed, relative velocity of the fish to the blade, and fish length. And I'll talk a little bit more about this when I go over the theoretical model for predicting blade strike and mortality. Um, one of the things we've seen from turbine survival studies in the U.S. that there's not a big difference in mortality rates among typical teleost or bony fish. So a trout, a bass, a sucker, um, carp, they all pretty much will have the same mortality, the only difference being how they vary in length. There are two species that are an exception. Um, one is not a teleos, that would be sturgeon. They have cartilaginous bodies, no scales, very tough skin, and they, they have been shown to have higher blade strike survival than teleos fish. The other one are eels. For an eel's length, it should actually have higher mortality than we typically see in turbines. 
So there's something with that, its sort of physiology or morphology and behavior that causes a, a nail that three or four feet in length that has higher survival than you normally would expect. But because of its size, it still has very high mortality. And it, the recent studies, which I will talk about in a second, um, have been conducted with blade strike to evaluate blade strike survival. And it's shown that you can have 90% survival with fish being hit by a blade for strike velocities up to 12 meters per second, depending on the fish length and the thickness of that blade. And I'll get into more of those details in a, in a moment. <clears throat> so, so blade strike survival uh, is affected by blade shape. So the, the shape of the profile of the blade, it's affected by the blade thickness. It's affected by the impact speed or the strike velocity, which is the relative velocity of the fish to the blade. And in most cases, we assume that the fish travel at the speed of the water. So it would be the relative velocity of the water to the blade. And then also fish length. And we refer to, and I'm going to talk about these studies that we've done, and we, we often look at the ratio of the fish length to the blade thickness in determining uh, strike mortality. So we did a series of studies funded by the Electric Power Research Institute where we uh, f put together a, a tank where we had a blade on a cart and fired it at fish that were hanging here. They were anesthetized and we used high-speed high video to record each impact. We looked at six different blade thicknesses and different lengths of fish, so different fish lengths to blade thickness ratios. We suspended the fish mainly perpendicular to the blade, but also at an angle. And then we evaluated for external injuries and survival, both immediate and uh, 96 hours after strike. And to summarize that data, uh, I have total survival over here on the uh, y-axis. And this is strike velocity in meters per second. Each set of symbols and lines represents a, a fish length to blade thickness ratio. So here, 0 0.75. This would be a fish whose length was actually less than the thickness of the blade. At 25, the fish is 20, its length is 25 times the thickness of the blade. So we can see that for the high LT ratios, that survival drops very quickly after we get above five meters per second. And, uh, is very low um, and down near zero, we would predict as you get over nine meters per second. We see that, that trend, the survival starts to increase as the fish length gets closer to the blade and it's relatively high uh, for when the fish length is equal to the blade or less. Now 12 meters per second is about the strike velocity of the Alden turbine, which I'll talk about later as well. Um, but it is lower than most conventional turbines. So strike velocities may be more on the order of 15 to 20 meters per second in many turbines we have out there now. And this just demonstrates the difference I had mentioned between sturgeon and, and uh, bony fish. This is the LT ratio here, so the, the length to thickness of the blade ratio. This is for trout and it's for veloc strike velocities of 10 to 12 meters per second. And we can see the, the, more, the survival decrease as the LT ratio gets greater. But for sturgeon at the same velocities, it's a much, the survival is much higher at, at higher LT ratios. So they do much better, they survive strike much better than other species. I'm gonna show you two videos now from the testing that we did, and you go ahead and hit that. So this, the fish is going to be placed here. The blade will come from right to left. And again, that fish is anesthetized and suspended with lines that will break free after it's struck. These cables are what the cart is traveling on. So when these begin to separate, you'll see the blade come from the right to the left. And this is at a speed of 12 meters per second. So fast. <laughs> And that, that, fish, that fish survived, but he probably woke up with a pretty good headache. <laughs> so this is a high-speed video that slows that impact down. And you can see before the blade was, excuse me, before the fish was hit, if you could repeat it, um, 
you can see the fish begins to move even before the blade gets there. And there's that pressure in front of the blade that the fish feels and can help it deflect away. And that's the importance of the semicircular profile, which we think is better than an elliptical one. All right, so now we know what mortality is from blade strike, and we can move on to how do we predict it or estimate it um, using a, a theoretical model. And some of you may have seen this. It's, a, it's been around for many years. Um, there are slightly different versions used by different folks, but it's a probability of strike. So it's just the probability that a fish of a given length can get between two blades in the time that the blades move the distance between each other. So it's, very, it's rather simple, and even as a biologist, I can kind of understand the formula. <laughs> <clears throat> so what we do to, the, to, to make it a turbine survival estimate, uh, a method for estimation, we add K, which is based on the strike mortality data that I just showed you. Um, and so now we can take that mortality data for different strike velocities, different blade thicknesses, fish lengths, and, and apply it spe to specific turbines. And, um, and so we've used that uh, at many projects in the U.S. We've also used it at a project in Estonia. And um, there are other people that use similar uh, uh, methods as well. So as far as actually measuring, um, I'm not going to talk a lot about the field techniques, but there are me methods that, um, that you can measure uh, turbine survival in the field, and that's been done quite a bit in Europe as well as the U.S. Uh, netting techniques have been used a lot, not, so quite, not quite as much lately. Um, I think they introduce some bias and, and a lot of injury and mortality that can't be accounted for. Um, and the tagging techniques generally are a better way to do it. So there are all kinds of uh, telemetry techniques. There have been some great developments in tags over the last few years. And um, you can do both direct and indirect mortality with many of those telemetry techniques, measure fish movement through the systems, as many folks have done here in Europe and uh, also in the U.S. And then the other method for specifically for... Uh, doing direct survival that's been used quite a bit is uh, balloon tags. And you can see down the bottom here, this is a sunfish and it's got a couple of tags. So these inflate after they pass through the turbine. They inject, it's basically a very simple chemical reaction that causes uh, the gas to inflate the balloons after it's been injected into the turbine. They put a radio tag on it. People in boats find the radio tag signal and then visually can see the balloons and, and capture the fish. So some of the advantages of that, is it's referred to as the high, high Z turbine tag developed by Paul High Z of Normando Associates. Um, but you get a very good direct turbine survival estimate. There are high recovery rates, you know, 95% plus. Um, high control survival, 99%, 100% for most tests. You, you recover the fish and have the ability to physically examine it for injuries. And um, very high statistical precision as long as you meet sample size requirements. But there is a potential for barotrauma bias in that because the fish are acclimated to the surface, you're only seeing what fish at the surface would experience with respect to pressure injury. Um, fish that are acclimated to depth might suffer more barotrauma at a particular site, depending on the conditions. All right, so moving on to the last part. What, what makes a, a turbine fish friendly? So I'll go over a few things here and then talk more about the technologies themselves. Um, small number of blades, so we saw that with the probability of strike, it, it's basically the space between the blades. The less blades you have for a given diameter, more space between the blades, easier for the fish to get through without being hit. You have more space between your blades if you have a larger diameter unit. Low rotational speeds, easier again for the fish to pass through, um, and that also may mean lower strike velocity, so less damage to the fish if it is struck. Typically, low head is going to lead to less effects of pressure and shear and some of the other um, injury mechanisms. Uh, obviously, a high minimum pressure, as I talked about earlier, if you keep that minimum pressure um, relatively high, as close to atmospheric or, or yeah, as, as close to atmospheric as possible, um, you, you shouldn't have to worry about that. Uh, optimal hydraulics, this nice streamlined flow pass through the units. Also on the downstream side, avoid vortices and, and swirls that would throw the fish around and cause it to hit walls and diso become disoriented. And then efficient operation 
also helps create a lot of the good conditions that we like to see for fish moving through. So just before I go in, so we, we actually have a lot of turbines like this now, and I think it was mentioned earlier that there are some pretty fish-friendly turbines, conventional designs, in particular Kaplan or bulb turbines with only three or four blades, large diameters, low rotational speeds. Um, survival can be 95 to 97%. But there are improvements that can be and have been made. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is the minimum gap runner. That was developed by Voith in the U.S. as part of a program by the U.S. Department of Energy. And basically what it's doing is trying to minimize, so if we have a look at the standard Kaplan, these gaps between the blades and the outer ring, and then also between the hub and the inside of the blade. And so they've taken those gaps out with their, this new design, as you can see. So all of the blade positions when that blade and the Kaplan rotates will keep those openings closed. There have been uh, two sites where they've installed minimum gap runners in the U.S., both on the Columbia River. One is at Bonneville. That was the first installation back in the late 90s. And they estimated they had 97% survival through the minimum gap runner, um, which was greater than the existing Kaplan units. I believe it was about 94% survival. So the bonus there was they increased survival, but they also get more efficiency out of these new units. And so it was a win for the fish and for the project owner. More recently, uh, there were minimum gap runners installed and tested at the Wanapum Dam. And they also had a 90% average survival. But interestingly enough, the existing units had 97.5%. So statistically, there's probably no difference there. They did get 11% more power out of the units without increasing mortality. And the reason they probably, it was probably the same is that the existing units had five blades, but the new minimum gap runners actually had six blades. So that's probably why the survival didn't change. Now I'm going to talk about the Alden turbine. Some of you may be familiar with this. Um, it, was again, it was also developed under the same program from the U.S. Department of Energy uh, that the Voith minimum gap runner was. Um, it is a commercially ready turbine, but it has not been installed at any site. So we have laboratory data that I'll talk about, but we don't have any field data for it yet. We're, we're actively seeking somebody to be the first. And if there's any volunteers, let me know. Talk to me afterwards. Um, so the, de the design was to come up with, a, based on biology first, come up with a fish-friendly design. And it's three helical blades that wrap around the hub with no gaps in between. It's got few wicket gates, and they're long for nice, smooth uh, flow streamlines. There's a shroud attached to it, and that eliminates the gaps on the outside. So there are no gaps there. The shroud spins with the turbine. Favorable hydraulics, it was designed with computer modeling to create shear and turbulence conditions that would minimize injury. And it's got a high minimum pressure, so we can rule out uh, any damage associated with pressure. The, the prototype design ideally would be somewhere for heads between 6 and 35 meters, and the flow would be about anywhere from 15 uh, to 80 cubic meters per second. We did do a pilot scale biological evaluation, and we evaluated a 1.2 meter diameter unit. It, that simulated, uh, we simulated 12 and 24 meters ahead. It was 240 RPM at the lower head and 345 at the higher head. We did tests with and without wicket gates. We did tests at the best efficiency point and five points off best efficiency. And we looked at six species, including multiple size groups of a couple of them. When we were done testing, we had evaluated a total of 40,000 fish, 20,000 treatment, and 20,000 controls. This is the test facility down here, flow moving in this direction, treatment fish were injected here, passed through the turbine, control fish were injected at the same time, they all went up a screen and into a tank where they could be collected, held for uh, latent mortality, and then looked at for injuries. This summarizes the results, so we, we have uh, fish length versus immediate survival. As we expected with any turbine, as fish length increases, the probability of strike increases, the probability of mortality increases. 
So this is the uh, 40 or the, the 12 meter head, and this is a, uh, um, sorry, yeah, 12 meter, uh, and, and then this is the, uh, I guess, the 26 meter head. So you can see as with the higher rotational speed, we had uh, higher mor uh, mortality as well. This is all rainbow trout, the red circles, blue circles are rainbow trout. We also have uh, herring, coho salmon, smallmouth bass, and uh, sturgeon for the lower head. And what I mentioned earlier was the sturgeon. The sturgeon had statistically higher survival than the other species. So this plus the blade strike test confirm that the sturgeon do, do better going through the turbine. The other interesting thing, you'll notice we tested eels, but they don't fit on the graph because their length is much longer than the other fish we tested, and they had 100% survival, immediate survival. Um, so that was a bit of a surprise to us, uh, but we were very happy to see that. So I'm going to show two videos. The first one on the left is real time. And what you'll see is fish entering from right to left. These are the blades spinning. So those are rainbow trout at the 12 meter head. And <clears throat> keep in mind the survival rates here for this pilot scale for this condition were about 90%, excuse me, 90% or better. Um, pretty much they're, they're on their ride of their life there. I turned the volume down so you can't hear the screaming. But <laughs> if you could hit the next video. So this is the high speed. So these are the fish coming in. You can see the blades in the background and the fish going through. This particular video is a combination of several, and there are some fish that get down between the blades. That fish there looked like it just got hit. But again, about nine, nine and a half fish got through there without being hit, and that's 245 revolutions per minute. So that was the pilot scale. If we scale up the survival estimates to a prototype full-scale unit, that's about four meters in diameter with 110 RPM, we would expect these species that we tested to have 98 to 100% survival or about a 200 millimeter fish. The American eel and the white sturgeon, even in size lengths of 600 to 1,000 millimeters, we expect it could be as high as 99 to 100%. And this shows the estimate for one site it was being considered at in the U.S. Herring was the primary species of interest there, but they also have eels. It's uh, 28 meters ahead, 43 cubic meters per second flow, 4 meter diameter, and 120 RPM. And if we just go to the 200 millimeter reference point for fish length, we predicted 98.4% survival. But even for 300 millimeter fish, we would be over 95% survival. Um, how am I doing on time? I, uh, how am I doing on time? I got a f okay, a couple more slides. I'm, I'm almost near the end. Uh, so he, here, I'm going to go over a few more technologies. You've already seen some of these, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. Um, but the Archimedes screw, uh, the very low head turbine, and then the Galt, this is a Galt Green turbine, which is um, developed by some folks in Canada. It has not been installed or tested with fish. We saw the survival rates for the, uh, the screw turbines in the VLH, 95 to 100 percent for salmonids and eels, and they have made some tweaks to both of those to try to uh, keep survival on the high end. Uh, then there is the, uh, the Nyhaus turbine um, that was also mentioned. Uh, I think it was said uh, less than eight meters ahead, so I might be a little off there. Um, three blades, variable speed at a full-scale prototype, they estimate, depending on the site, might be 60 to 90 RPM. And again, they estimated in some pilot scale tests that eel survival was 100%. Uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about is a new turbine being developed for um, the uh, <clears throat> Ice Harbor Dam on the Snake River. And it's a large dam and it's uh, operated by the Corps of Engineers in the U.S., and they have contracted Voith to basically come up with a new turbine design. It, it's still going to be a Kaplan propeller-type turbine, but they asked them to, to design it for fish friendliness first and then power production second. Obviously, that's a key component, though, and, and it will be an efficient unit. Um, 
it's the most downstream dam on the Snake River. It's got a lot of important salmonids. Uh, significant focus on improving downstream migrating, survival for downstream stream migrating salmon that are listed as endangered under the U.S. Uh, Endangered Species Act. It's a collaborative design effort between several government agencies and Voith Hydro, and it's going to include two adjustable bladed units and one fixed blade to replace three of their existing Kaplans. And for the pressure, this is one of the key components they're putting into the design is that the minimum pressure will be about 12 PSI, uh, so a little less than 100 kilopascals. So they've gone through a pretty intensive study process to develop this design that's included CFD modeling, physical modeling. Um, they're, right now they're fabricating the runner and other water passageways, and then they plan to install it in 2017 or just, bef uh, just before and then evaluate it for biological performance. So just to wrap up, uh, to go through the different areas I talked about, um, barotrauma and strike are likely the primary injuries suffered by fish passing through turbines in Europe with a lot of low head projects. It's likely strike will be the predominant uh, factor and uh, you know, less than about 15 meters in head. Theoretical strike probability and mortality models can be used to estimate turbine survival for most species and train through Francis and propeller type units. Um, the one that we haven't really figured out is eels. Uh, there is some information out there developed by Michelle Larinier, and we did some work for EDF recently where we try to use regression models using field data uh, to develop a prediction method. Telemetry techniques have, have really advanced in recent years and are an effective way of evaluating survival as well as balloon tagging. And then finally, I think there is a lot of good stuff going on with fish-friendly turbine development. And I think some of this can be applied here. We've seen it with the low head designs, but I think there may also be stuff that could be done to improve Kaplan or Bulb or you know, maybe even Francis turbines. So thank you.